All right. So uh, just to kind of go over in the uh, last couple talks, we uh, went over basic pacemaker programmability um, in like the VVI mode, uh, mode selection in general. Uh, we talked about the conduction system of the heart. Um, we did a 12 lead uh, interpretation of MI through uh, Julius, who was a fantastic presentation there. Um, looking forward to seeing more of that for sure. Um, and then Jared picked up with SVT discrimination um, and basic um, functionality with ICDs. So I think we'll probably just take a little bit of a step back here because I think we're getting into some complex subjects and just go over some more general pacemaker functionality, specifically focusing on the electrical concepts behind pacing. So uh, like always, I, I love to have input. So if you have any questions as I'm presenting, you know, feel free to, to chime in. If you raise your hand on Zoom, I can't actually see it. So just come off mute and um, ask away. And, you know, I really appreciate, appreciate any uh, participation you have. So we'll go ahead and get started. Let's see here. Okay. So uh, I really quickly wanted to kind of browse over the different kinds of leads that you may come across on the market. So you have your packs, your passive fixation leads, which you may or may not have um, come across. These are great. They tend to be less traumatic to the tissue. Um, they have maybe a little bit of a safer patient profile, especially with atrial leads if there's a place to put them. So if they still have an intact atrial appendage, there's a lot of trabeculation and these little tines can actually um, engage in the atrial appendage and just kind of sit right there. Um, if they've had those clipped through surgery, it's a lot harder to place those. And I wouldn't recommend um, necessarily a passive lead in someone who no longer has an appendage, but I'm sure it's been done. Uh, here are epicardial leads. So these, I looking at it, I believe this is the Medtronic style. Um, here is uh, manufactured by Great Batch. Uh, this is more of an active fixation helix, but these are actually done by um, either doing a window or doing a full open heart surgery and attaching these leads to the uh, epicardium of the uh, of the heart. So the way it functions is it actually captures from the outside in. Um, here is another epicardial lead. You have your active uh, fixation leads. This one is a retractable helix. You can see the helix has been retracted in this case. Some come with a um, active helix that's actually already out. Um, but just to give you an idea, these are most likely what you'll see a lot of times. Um, so the way these function is you have your tip electrode, and then you have a um, at the distal end here, and then you have a more proximal electrode, or you use the can as your um, as your anode. So your cathode will be your tip typically, and then your anode will be the source to where the electrical, uh, elect the electrons basically flow. So in this case, here's your ring electrode. Um, you'll paste from the tip, the cathode negative, and then it'll move to the positive. Um, I just want to kind of demonstrate here, older leads didn't actually have bipolar capability. Bipolar is relatively new in the last couple decades, um, but, um, Conventional leads are mostly bipolar for the most part now. So in this case, where is the anode located in bipolar pacing? You have your cathode, your negative here, and then your anode will be at your ring electrode, or if it's say like an integrated um, lead like you have with Boston, it could be your, um, your conductor coil. So it's just going to be a little more proximal, but we're not going to the can. If you're going um, unipolar, then it would be the tip to the can being the positive here. And the reason why I'm saying positive and negative, why does it matter? Uh, it's just how you complete the electrical circuit, basically. So the electrons are going to flow from a negative to a positive. Um, in a unipolar lead, you can see here, it's much simpler if I didn't cross through it. Um, just a single uh, core to it versus the modern bipolar. Um, they used to be side by side. Now they actually wrap the ring um, electrode around the outside, separated by an insulator right here. Um, it's kind of interesting to see because you see that the um, the anode, the ring electrode is actually uh, more exposed in some sense. It has less insulation. So typically when you see bipolar leads failing in modern bipolar leads, it's the ring electrode that is failing. In those cases, you can actually program unipolar to um, to circumvent this, um, this option here that could be um, failing, which we'll get to later on. So. Uh, so what are your goals for cardiac pacing? So the real reason, you know, 
the real motivation behind pacemakers is we want to make sure we capture, obviously, because if we're not uh, properly depolarizing the heart, then what are we doing? And then we want to sense. So uh, modern pacemakers, obviously, we want to sense the intrinsic activity that's going on in the heart and inhibit pacing accordingly um, and or track and or any number of things we kind of discussed when we talked about pacing modes. Um, <clears throat> So these are affected by many factors. Basically, um, your ability to capture, your ability to sense, um, you just have the core electrical concepts that can affect it, but you can also have um, impedance, which is a relation of the leads you're using, um, as well as the patient. Um, parameters you've programmed, the patient's own um, cardiac activity and baseline. So uh, there's gonna be a lot of things that come into play here when you're evaluating um, pulse amplitude, pulse width, um, sorry, when you're evalu evaluating your ability to capture and sense. And I guess what I'm really trying to tell you here is that you're not going to find a, um, a catch-all for every single person. Your parameters will differ from patient to patient. Um, it will depend on whether or not you're trying to extend longevity or ensure capture. Um, and there's a lot of things that come into play, so we'll get to them. Uh, so capture is the... Um, is the minimum amount of energy that is required to consistently depolarize the myocardium. So when you're assessing a capture threshold, it's just whether or not you can evoke a response um, in the tissue consistently. Um, <clears throat> and I guess things to keep in mind here is the capture threshold is not a constant over time. It can vary, um, you know, between implants and follow-up. It can vary between a uh, number of factors like heart failure, um, so just be aware that you're not going to have a, um, it's not a simple answer of what is capture and what is not, especially because we're trying to conserve battery over time. So when we're determining capture, um, we're looking at a number of different factors, uh, specifically the amount of energy or the amplitude, it's actually voltage, um, and the total time that you're giving that voltage. Um, <clears throat> so you may have seen this curve. I'm sure Elvis, you see it when you're looking for the studying for the IBHRE, but this is your, uh, your strength and duration curve. And essentially this is showing you that everything it's getting away from me here. Um, <clears throat> everything below the line here is not sufficient, um, time or voltage to capture the heart. Everything above is. And the reason why I kind of wanted to display, um, this chart here for you is that it shows no matter how long you're um, you're giving a it's getting away here giving a a, a pulse for there's a there's a certain period of time it doesn't matter how long you give energy it's not sufficient to capture the heart versus voltage there is a, a greater association between the amount of voltage given and um, ability to depolarize the tissue so when you're assessing whether or not you capture you may be assessing, well, can I bump out my pulse width to try to maintain uh, battery longevity? At a certain point, it's not going to do you any good. Um, so just keep this in mind when you're um, trying to program an optimized battery, which we will get to here. Um, so one of the things we talked about here uh, is acute to chronic thresholds. So what you may see at implant is that your threshold could be, for example, 1.2 volts, but later on at follow-up, the threshold is exceeded and maybe you're not actually capturing anymore. Um, that is why typically we set a nice safety margin, which we'll get to, but um, just things to keep in mind as you're navigating and implanting devices um, is that, you know, initial implants don't necessarily determine uh, long-term thresholds. So I kind of wanted to visualize this for you, and these aren't, you know, given numbers, these kind of depend um, patient to patient, but it's not unheard of to have uh, out or thresholds that are uh, elevated above three volts during initial implant. I especially see, and I don't know, um, you know, what you other implanters see in the field, but for atrial lead placement, for example, when you really screw in that active fixation helix, you may see the threshold even go up to five volts. Um, as long as your impedance and other numbers look good, those are usually a recommendation to give it time because contemporary leads use steroid elution, um, which I'll show you here on the next slide, but it really tends to bring down the threshold. So you'll see this initial rise in threshold associated with a current of injury. 
which we will talk about later um, when we're discussing implants. But you'll see this initial rise um, <clears throat> after letting it set in for around 20 minutes or so, you may see thresholds come down to more appropriate numbers. Um, but then at follow up, you may see that those thresholds have risen again, up, you know, up to 2.5 volts. So just things to be aware of. So when we're talking about acute to chronic thresholds, we were, you know, steroid elution has really um, changed the game as far as our long term outcomes and thresholds. So here is, an, is a slide kind of indicating the total amount of time. And then you're looking at the total amount of voltage needed to capture the heart and an implant, you know, we're at one volt great threshold. But as you see over time before steroid elution, um, you send to see this, this sharp trend in, uh, in threshold over the next few weeks. And then it slowly tapers back down to a baseline, but you still see an elevation over implant. With steroid elution, it actually helps to um, prevent scar building up around the electrode. Hello. Yes, sir. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Oh, sorry. I thought you had a question there. Welcome to the call. Yeah. So we were just talking about uh, modern leads and steroid elution. So you're not going to see this and you may see it still in your textbooks when you're studying, but you really don't see modern leads really having such a sharp upward trend in threshold over time. Um, and that's just because of the uh, steroid elution that we see in modern leads. All right. So what can affect threshold? So any number of things. Um, it can be activity. It could be the posture. So you may evaluate a patient on the table. Um, and then right later on when they're standing up, you may see that the threshold is different. That could be any number of things. It could be a vector difference, um, <clears throat> time of day, comorbidities, heart failure, whether or not they've eaten, whether or not they've taken their prescription drugs or any kind of um, non-prescribed drugs, um, and then progression of diseases over time. So things to keep in mind when you're when you're programming a patient, just because you thresh, assess the threshold to be one volt, you don't necessarily set them at 1.25 volts ongoing with a permanent setting because um, you could be capturing now, but later on they stand up and walk around and now all of a sudden their, uh, their threshold rises to two volts. Well, you no longer have enough energy to consistently capture the heart. And in patients who are dependent on a device, uh, that's not ideal. So things to keep in mind there when you're assessing. So that is why we have a nice safety margin. So modern safety margins, we do around two to one or three to one, or we use some sort of automatic capture algorithm to assess that. Abbott uses auto capture. Um, I don't know the names for the Medtronic ones and Medtronic experts, feel free to, to chime in. But uh, essentially the device does it for you where it assesses what capture and non-capture looks like. And then, um, determines what the threshold is and then gives it a nice margin over the top. Um, if you're not able to do that, then we just merely say, for example, the threshold is one volt. We may set the output at two volts, so a two to one margin. Um, <clears throat> but the big thing is we're not we're trying to extend the longevity of the device without compromising the safety for the patient. So uh, when you have these fluctuations, obviously it could not be ideal. Um, <clears throat> Really quick too, while we're on this subject here, um, you know, feel free to contact any of us when we're trying to optimize the battery. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that not every manufacturer has the same um, battery makeup and the batteries don't always function the same based upon the, the circuit board attached to it. So for example, Abbott devices have what's called a voltage doubler at 2.5 volts and a voltage tripler at five volts, right? So if you can, um, we discussed the, th the strength and duration curve here. If you can, <clears throat> it's a little more acute, I guess, like that. Um, it, if you can keep the voltage underneath 2.5 volts, you'll find that the battery lasts considerably longer because it doesn't have to the circuit board doesn't have to basically double the amount of energy being drained here. So for example, if we assess the threshold um, at two or three, say three volts at 0 0.4 milliseconds, but 
the threshold is going to be, for example, at one millisecond, it's only going to be one volt, right? So in this case, it's actually advantageous to program the patient two volts, if I can do it with my right hand, at one millisecond. And that sounds counterintuitive, right? Because you're delivering energy for twice as long in this case. But because you're not hitting a voltage doubler, um, you're more efficient in your output. Once again, this is all kind of a, a deeper dive, but if you ever have a patient that comes in and they're programmed at five volts at 0 0.4 milliseconds, it may be good to reach out to one of the device experts and ask them how you can optimize that so you have um, as little current drain as possible and extend the life of the battery. It can make a difference of one to two years sometimes. So um, it can be very impactful for our patients. <clears throat> so next we talk about um, sensing and the threshold behind it. So similar to what we talked about with uh, voltage, but the inverse, it's the smallest intrinsic signals that can be consistently sensed by the pacemaker. Um, <clears throat> so there's a couple of ways you can do that too. The device itself can actually measure the amplitude of the sensed um, R wave or P wave, um, or you can actually manually decrease down the, uh, the sensitivity, which we'll show here. So here's a good diagram. If you can see here, here's your R wave, here's your T wave, this device would effectively be double counting because the sensing threshold is set so low. So what we'll slowly do is we will raise this fence here until it's enough to consistently sense, but without over sensing this T wave. And that will be your new sensing threshold. They may double it, or that'll be your new sensing threshold. And then you'll actually set your setting at a two to one. So in this case, this may be 1.5. Um, you really have to understand how tall these R waves are before you set your sensing. But in general, um, if you have two millivolt R waves, um, you know, you're really going to have to set your sensing quite low. One millivolt, if your R waves are 12, then your sensing can be, you know, a lot a lot uh, higher threshold at six millivolts. In general, the lower the fence, the more sensitive the device is. So it's kind of an, an inverse relation. So if we say we want a lower sensitivity, um, we actually want to have a, a lower value as well. Does that make sense? Hopefully everyone's still on the page here. Sorry, can you kindly repeat that um, sensitivity and sensing? Yes. Yeah, so in a sense. Yeah. Um, and, and just to go over it, sorry, really quick, because you'd ask. Um, <clears throat> basically, your sensitivity threshold is this fence here. And that's that's the best way to like kind of picture it as as a fence. Um, and your goal is to not see what's happening here with the T wave, but you still want to see what's happening here with the uh with the R wave, right? So you have to raise your sensitivity value so that it's above the T wave. Um, in this case, if you have your sensitivity set at 1.25, you are very sensitive. So the device will see every kind of signal that is above 1.25 millivolts. In this case, that's both the R and the T. By raising your sensitivity threshold, or by, sorry, by raising your sensitivity program setting, you can effectively miss what's occurring here. Um, you don't over sense the T waves, but you're still properly sensing the R waves. That way the device can respond accordingly and inhibit pacing when it needs to um, and pace when it doesn't. Uh, things to keep in mind though, PVCs tend to be wide and ugly. they tend to be very tall. So if you measure a PVC, it could be 12 millivolts, but their intrinsic could only be six millivolts. So you don't want to program based on PVCs because you'll set your sensitivity setting so high that you never actually see the intrinsic conduction. Um, so just things to, to look for there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. It's fine. Okay. Um, so we then talked about safety margins with capture. There's also a safety margin with uh, with sensing as well. And we um, we still use this this two to one 
idea that you see with capture as well. So in general, um, if you have an R wave that's six millivolts, you may set your sensing at half of that. So three millivolts for your R wave. Um, and that just ensures that you may um, be able to sense when uh, those values change. Just like capture sensing can change over time, it can be positional, it could be disease progression, any number of things. And if you just set it for um, five millivolts, for example, we may be under sensing when the patient is lying prone, which means we could be pacing either into vulnerable periods or pacing when the patient doesn't need to pace, which is obviously not ideal. So just things to keep in mind, everything in, in pacing in general is a two to one, a lot of times, two to one capture margin, two to one safety margin. When we talk about implants um, with leadless, two to one plays a major factor as well. So, all right, so now we talk about impedance. So impedance is one of the best ways to evaluate your, your lead integrity. And basically impedance is the measure of resistance to the flow of electrons um, within the circuit, right? And what the value of the impedance is, as long as it's within reason, generally between, this case it said 300 and 1500, but 200 and uh, 2000 is also, you know, what you'll see. Generally, you'll see the impedance somewhere in this range. If it gets below, then we're in trouble. Um, but the actual number itself it matters less than the consistency of the impedance. Um, so if you are consistently, man, this is really click happy today. If, you're, if your impedance trend is consistently within like around 450 ohms and it stays this way, that's generally a pretty strong indicator that the lead integrity is, is going well. If you see your impedance trend over time having this slow rise or you see sudden jumps in impedance or drops in impedance, that can indicate that we have... Um, a much larger issue to address. So here it's, it's kind of describing like the factors that can influence impedance. In general, um, what we're looking for though is, is changes in impedance over time um, because a lot of these things are, are controlled for. So um, when we talk about impedance as an indicator of lead integrity, the big things, like I said, we're looking for is drops, jumps or slow rises or falls and impedance indicating possible issues. So I think the best way to describe this is actually by using this hose metaphor that's been um, used many times. But basically, if you, if you use a garden hose, um, your normal resistance is the amount of friction that the uh, that the water has to leave this hose, right? So you're, you have this natural friction force or natural resistance on the line as the water is trying to leave, right? Um, but if you see over time that when you turn on the water, um, you're having less water flow out the tip or less current, um, that indicates that there's less resistance somewhere in the line and there could be a hole in your hose. Um, inversely, if you open the hose and not much current comes out at all, um, but it's, it's a high pressure system, that could mean that there is a knot or a kink in your hose, which could mean that there is uh, damage to the conductor itself. So I kind of use this visualization. I, I think this is really a good example of a conductor failure. Man, this is, I'm gonna use my keyboard. Of a conductor failure versus um, you have insulation breach here. So either one of these can affect the device's ability to pace can affect the device's ability to sense over time and the things to watch out for. Um, what you'll see sometimes with conductor failures is you can have what's called make break signals where there's actually a separation. Uh, occasionally say when the patient stretches or when the lead is stressed, um, causing it to not be able to capture. But then when it comes back together again, when, the, um, when these metal pieces you know, unite, it could act normally. So what you may see occasionally is inconsistent capture, but when you measure the impedance, it, uh, it's within a range. So those are the reasons why when you look at those impedance trends over time, if you see a bunch of random outliers here, this could indicate that we have some sort of conductor failure and we need to monitor and or revise this lead. Everybody on page there? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Move so. On. I think this is a good example here. Um, uh, basically, a, this is a patient came in for a gen change. Um, 
And when they evaluated the lead impedance at the time, uh, it was 1800 ohms. So they did a chest X-ray. And if you look at it, there is just a clear issue going on. Now, it's not always this, uh, this clear, but in general, if you see a chest X-ray and there seems to be damage to the lead um, and there's a trend in the impedance that indicates that, um, you know, you may need a revision. Um, it's, these are all things that are better to know before you actually have the patient on the table. But I think that um, one practice that I always do personally for gen changes is evaluate the lead integrity. And then while I'm monitoring the patient, have them do different isometric exercises like stretches, um, any kind of resistance, um, windmilling their left arm, things like that. And that's kind of evaluating if there's some structural damage. We may see it registering as noise on the lead. We may see it um, register as non-capture, any number of things, but it's all good to evaluate while the patient's in for a generator change. Uh, one of the most common you know, issues with uh, generator changes is infection. So if we can avoid having to open the patient up a second time after we just change the device out because there's some issue with the lead. Um, so I advise to evaluate the leads early and often. And then just basically assessing integrity. Obviously, you're going to be looking at trends, and then you're going to look at how do the changes have actually happened. Have they been sudden? Have they been gradual? Um, all things to keep in mind. We had talked about pacemaker functionality, but just to go over it, because I think it's really important for everyone, just remember pacemaker functions with uh, ICDs will inhibit therapy as far as shocks, but will not affect the pacemaker. Um, with a pacemaker, when you apply a magnet to it, it will cause it to pace asynchronously, um, either VOO or DOO, depending on it's programmed. And then it's also usually used to be an indicator of battery life. So in Abbott devices, if you place a magnet over a pacemaker and it's 100 beats a minute, that means that it is uh, generally a, a pretty good battery and they have some more life left on it. As you get closer to 85 beats a minute asynchronous, that indicates that the battery is uh, nearing what's called ERI, um, where it needs to be replaced. So you can use that to evaluate as well as using magnets during surgery so that you don't have to permanently program the device. As long as the magnet is over it, it will be in its magnet mode. Once you take the magnet off, it reverts uh, back to a non-magnet mode. Everybody cool on we're on all that as far as the electrical concepts. How does everyone feel there? Yes. Yeah, that's good, Mike. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. So moving along to pacemaker timing cycles. Um, this is kind of if you don't deal with pacemakers, it's kind of a difficult concept, but I think it's easiest just to remember that pacemakers are just a bunch of little clocks running at once. And when you, when an event occurs, it starts or stops a clock and that essentially dictates the behavior of the device. So when we talk about timing cycles, we just say, when are those clocks starting? When are those clocks stopping? Um, refractory periods is when the device um, is able to basically observe a signal, but it doesn't respond to them. Uh, blanking periods are when the device is completely blind to any kind of signal that could be occurring. Um, and then alert periods is when the device is able to uh, sense an intrinsic activity and respond to it appropriately. So um, just keep that in mind as we jump into this. So the timing cycles are broken up between atrial and ventricular timing cycles. Um, you have your initial AV delays, which is the time between an atrial event and a ventricular event. Specifically, for example, a paced AV delay is a time between a paced atrial event and a sensed atrial event. Um, generally, you'll see your paced AV delays longer than your sensed AV delays. Part of that is because by the time that we actually, you know, sense an atrial event, that P wave has already been partially occurring. So we don't need to necessarily give as much time before we pace. We wanna have enough time to have adequate filling, but we don't wanna wait so long that they, um, you know, they lose that atrial kick or that 30% of their output. So that's why you'll see sense AV delays generally a little shorter. Uh, Ray responsive AV delay, that's just used um, to kind of act like a normal healthy AV node. As your exercise um, increases, you may see the natural time 
between a P wave and a QRS complex uh, gets shorter. Um, and that's just, uh, basically this is us trying to copy that, that natural occurrence there. Uh, short of say V delay is how short it gets. So we'd spoken in the past about VIP. I just want to kind of go over that briefly. So uh, <clears throat> essentially here, we're just trying to visualize how the AV delay functions. In this case, we have an atrial sensed event occurring here, which starts our AV delay. If you remember, our sensed AV delay in this case was 150 milliseconds, so we'll call it 150. I'm not going to count out the boxes here. It waits its full 150. No ventricular event occurs, so it paces. This, um, we wait till the next timing cycle, and atrial clock is started once again, since day V delay, when this atrial event occurs, it waits 150 and it paces. And it will just continue to do this until um, either an atrial, either a ventricular event comes through. If a true ventricular event comes through, through, it will then withhold the pace and reset the clock. Same thing, um, it is, in this case here, you see a paste event in the atrium, and then you see this delay um, in the ventricle is reset to 180 milliseconds. So you see a little bit longer delay. Um, does everyone kind of understand the concepts behind this? We've talked about VIP in the past, so this is a bit of a backtrack for some of you all, I'm sure. Um, but basically I'm just trying to demonstrate how the device, um, how the device regulates the atrial and ventricular events. And my wife just walked in. So, um, <clears throat> if an R wave is sent, so as we spoke about here, we have an ACE, we have a pace atrial event. It sets the pace AV delay, ventricular event paces, so on and so forth. In this case, we have a sensed atrial event. It sets the uh, sensed AV delay, but because an intrinsic ventricular event comes across before this timer runs out, it withholds the pace and then resets the timing cycle again. Um, same thing occurs here. And then here again, we have an atrial pace, a sensed ventricular event comes across, which resets the timer and it withholds the pace. Basically, um, the device is kind of responding appropriately. Uh, next, we have PVAR. So you may have heard of PVARP or post-ventricular atrial refractory period. Um, and basically what that means is that after a ventricular event, the atrium is put into refractory and doesn't respond to any kind of sensed event that could occur. Um, and the reason why we have PVARP, the reason why it exists at all, is a risk of retrograde conduction. So we talked about the AV node in the past um, and the intrinsic conduction of the heart. Um, but one thing that can actually occur is this AV node, even though it passes the electrical signal from the atrium to the ventricle, things can actually run backwards through that node as well and repolarize the atrium. So with a PMT, what you can actually happen here is a... Um, an atrial event is sensed, the device, yeah, I'm gonna go back to my mouse here. The device senses it, it paces in the ventricle, but because we don't have, um, because the atrium may, may be in refractory or for whatever reason, um, or say this is a PVC, the electrical impulse runs retrograde into the atrium. It is sensed again, the device sees it, interprets it as a true atrial event, and then paces again in the ventricle. And this creates essentially an endless loop tachycardia, but with the pacemaker being the accessory pathway. So when you talk about SVTs or AVNRTs, things like that, this is your pacemaker acting as um, the accessory pathway by essentially V pacing, sensing the retrograde event in the atrium, and then pacing on and on um, at a high rate. So with PVARP, what happens is when we have a ventricular event occur, the device effectively ignores anything that occurs in the atrium for a certain period of time. Um, in this case here, for example, our PVARP is too short. We have a PVC. This causes a retrograde A, and you can actually see this P wave right here. The device sees it as an atrial event. It then V paces, which causes a retrograde A, which the device sees an atrial event and it V paces on and on forever. 
if we've appropriately programmed our PVAR, when you have a ventricular pace, the device is in refractory for this period of time here where it's not watching. It will miss this atrial event and will stop this endless loop tachycardia from occurring. So that's why it's really important that you program your PVAR. Everyone on page with that? Yes. Okay, move on. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next up brings us to PVAB. So that's your post ventricular atrial blanking. Um, so basically for this, this is actually when the device is blind after a ventricular event. If you've inappropriately programmed your PVAB, what you may see occurring, like in this case, is double counting um, of atrial, or you'll basically see double counting because you'll be counting the ventricular signal on the atrial channel. Um, <clears throat> This can essentially lead the device to, in this case, it said AMS, but it senses this as an atrial arrhythmia. When this isn't an atrial arrhythmia, this is just a functionality of improperly programmed PVAB. So had this device had a proper PVAB, when this ventricular event occurred, either V-PACE or V-SENT, um, it will blank for a period of time, which will miss the, even the atrial event um, being over sense here and the device will no longer count this. So basically what we're doing with PVAB is we're trying to obscure what's happening in the ventricle on the atrial channel um, to avoid inappropriate mode switching. Things to keep in mind. Now, you don't want to just bump out your PVARP and your PVAB. Uh, that can actually just too far because that can affect a number of things like your two to one block rate or your device's ability to track high rates. With ICDs, it can affect your ability to discriminate um, atrial versus ventricular driven events because you may be under sensing atrial events. So PVAR, PVAB, all these timing cycle programmings uh, really come down to the specific patient, right? So the patient doesn't have conduction, he would have uh, short AV delays. If they do have conduction, we may have long AV delays. If a patient um, has very long retrograde, then we may set their PVARP at 330, 400 milliseconds. If the patient has no retrograde conduction at all, then you may shorten it to 175. Um, and, you know, it's less important to memorize specific numbers and programming, and more uh, important that you analyze the specific patient and optimize the device for them. So these are the kind of cases when you can reach out to us to help you through this process um, and assess, you know, how to program appropriately. So here's a good visualization of PVAB and PVARP. Uh, they both will start at the exact same time. So your two clocks both start at the same time. However, um, your PVAB obviously won't extend as long as your PVAR. So you have your atrial pace event, you have your ventricular pace, which starts the PVAB timer and the PVAR timer. Uh, this effectively blanks out any kind of far, um, you know, any kind of ventricular signal on the atrium with your PVAB. And then this will kind of uh, obscure any possible possibility of retrograde or inappropriate tracking with the device. Um, same thing here, if you have an intrinsic ventricular event, when the intrinsic ventricular event is first uh, sensed, that starts your PVAP and your PVARP timers as well. So just a way to visualize it. That brings us to our ventricular timers. So just like we had blanking in the atrium, we also have uh, blanking in the ventricle as well. Uh, this is to avoid any kind of um, oversensing of the atrial pace, especially on the ventricular channel. Um, it could be very uh, detrimental to have um, to basically sense that atrial spike. What you could see occurring is the device could see the atrial spike, interpret that as a ventricular event, withhold the ventricular pace, and you could just have atrial pacing all day long with no accompanying ventricular pacing. So as a result, we tell that device just to cover its eyes um, for a period of time after we pace to avoid any kind of um, inappropriate inhibition of uh, the device. So here it is visualized. We have an atrial pace. We don't actually see what's happening with the ventricular signal this is just an EKG, but the device has immediately sensed a ventricular event and it withholds its ventricular pace. We see a VS here. The ventricular pace that would normally occur out here has been withheld and this patient has gone without a uh, proper 
um, you know, ventricular event for more than two cycles. Um, this can be, you know, obviously symptomatic for patients and it can be deadly if, um, if not programmed appropriately. So that's why these exist. Once again, um, memorizing everything about uh, PVAR, PVAB, all these different things is less important than understanding why they occur and understanding that these devices are very simple in their nature. They're, they're very intelligent at what they do, but they're very dumb in the fact that they can't really make executive decisions. So when we're programming devices, it's up to the programmer to understand what the specific patient's um, you know, situation is. And then also, uh, and then appropriately programming the device so it responds to what it sees. Because inherently, these clocks just run, and the device responds based upon what it's observed. So programming your capture, programming your sensing, programming your blanking and refractory periods all play a role in how the device is able to respond um, and do its job appropriately. So um, in this case, we talked about, or we talked about blanking here is V refractory. That's just to avoid um, oversensing any kind of T waves or anything like that. Um, and double counting of QRSs. So essentially um, we don't need to have our eyes closed, but we need to not respond to it and call it a ventricular event if a patient has tall T waves. So that's really all I have. And I think that I probably could have explained things a little more clearly. So if you have specific questions, I'm happy to go through these and you know answer whatever you may have. We also have other people on the line that can answer your questions. Uh, once again, it's it's not about knowing every single idiosyncrasy of the device. It's just understanding how um, how we can use the tools that we have to optimize a device for a patient. That was really good, AJ. It's Jared here. Good talk, mate. No, oh, thanks. Thank you. Just more um, <laughs> say again. I said, I think I need more coffee, but other than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to go right back to the start when you were talking about um, lead lead design with uh, the unipolar, I think it might have been your first slide, uh, the tip to ring um, on your leads. I think it's two things that come to mind immediately, especially for in clinic and even during implant to look out for is that if you if a patient does present with a, a high impedance at clinic in a typical bipolar configuration, you as we say, tip to ring, then you know it's not all panic stations because as you say, changing the uh, pacing configuration or, or to um, to unipolar tip to ring, and then if you find that the impedance is actually normalized, then you can isolate the issue to the uh, the ring electrode. So usually that doesn't necessarily immediately mean that, you know, having to send the patient for a lead, uh, lead replacement. So find, yeah, if you do find yourself finding patients with a, a high impedance in bipolar and acute high impedance, then it's always worth testing it in unipolar. And mm -hmm. if unipolar is okay, as I said, you can pretty much then isolate the issue to the ring electrode. If the issue is yeah. in, if you go to unipolar and the issue is still high, then the issue the, the the issue then typically lies with the tip electrode. So you are probably looking at lead replacement at that point, uh, almost imminently. I I don't know about you, but I, I have seen some instances too where you can capture better ring um, ring unipolar, um, and in those cases, I I think it's typically some sort of um, calcification or things like that on the electrode. I don't, have you observed that as well, where ring is still an option sometimes? Yeah, once or twice, but not a huge amount. Um, yeah. I think you got to get lucky, but um, the other the other instance which is probably worth bringing up is is especially at implants, um, especially if, maybe for an operator or even as the even as the uh, the rep or the physiologist in charge of, of testing the devices. When it comes to if you think there's an issue, maybe of perforation. Um, again, we're going to be typically programmed tip to ring here. And sometimes if you do have lead perforation, then usually your tip electrode has come out perhaps of the myocardium. But because your circuit with the ring electrode is so short, you can still capture enough myocardium with enough output. And if there's ever an issue, perhaps that you have perforated, then again, it's it's always worth programming uh, the device to unipolar tip to, tip to can. And if you get no capture, then that is probably evident that the tip electrode is outside of the myocardium. So it's just a little tip there. If you do think you've perforated, program unipolar. And if you've got no capture, 
um, the chances are that your ring electrode is outside the myocardium. But you can be you can be fooled sometimes in bipolar if you have perforated that you've still got capture because because it's such a small circuit with enough with enough output you can still capture around that ring electrode. So again, just something to be looked forward to look to look towards and. Um, can also be seen perhaps on your if you measure your injury current you may get a, a negative injury current as the current is moving away from the electrode mm -hmm. so again that's another indication that perhaps you are uh have perforated so yeah just, just for clarification to the group when he's speaking about injury current so when you are evaluating the unfiltered signal on um the psa or pulse sense analyzer we use during implants um injury current is basically widening of the qrs and or, um, you know, like you may see like a T wave um, elevation as well from baseline versus like a narrow signal. So if you look over and your paced signal, you're still capturing, but it's very narrow versus maybe a, like a wider signal here. Um, that could mean that you don't have good tissue contact. Um, in this case, he also mentioned negative. So if you see a negative injury current from baseline, that's that's usually not ideal. I, you can be tricked depending on how the lead is setting um, against the myocardium, but in general, that just means that the electrical impulse is moving away from the uh, the tip electrode. Um, Jared, that, that was a really good point. I what you mentioned as far as capture. Uh, one thing that I um, a physician showed me a, a number of years back that I thought was pretty cool, and I, I like to use for implants is um, just quickly going unipolar. Uh, with the cables as you're implanting a lead just to assess whether or not the unipolar impedance is higher than the bipolar impedance. So in general, your unipolar impedance through the electrical system should be lower. But if you've perfed into the myocardium, what you may find um, is that your unipolar impedance, because you're outside of the heart itself, um, is, is higher. And um, in those cases, it's always a good idea to pause and maybe assess the lead if you do see that. It's not always 100% um, specific. You can get false positives, but it's pretty, um, you know, it's pretty sensitive as well. So you're you're more likely to get a false positive by having a higher neg uh, higher uh, unipolar impedance, but um, you're more likely to detect it in general. So just a, a quick trick that you can just do as you're um, assessing lead integrity, especially if um, during the implant, they seem to have put it into an unsafe location, like more anterior, um, as opposed to more septal locations. Absolutely. Um, I, I was going to follow up with what Gerard, um, Gerard was saying. Uh, with with uh, um, um, like ST depression as opposed to STEMI <clears throat> for your injury current. Um, and you, you've got, obviously both of you have covered it really, really well. But the other thing also, if you've got like a half perforation, what we did notice in the patient is that um, with your sensing of the R wave, you can have like respiratory variations can also have a fluctuation in the R wave sensing as well. Um, so that that could also be an indication that, that there is a slight perforation. For instance, if the tip, if the anode has, has maybe sort of gone far beyond, and and the ring is still in the in the myocardium itself, and um, so as it breathe in and breathe out, the vapor, you might get some fluctuations in there. And we saw that with with an ICD patient a while back. So, but the, the thing to look out for really is your is your. Um, Obviously, injury current, you get SD elevation, so STEMI. Um, if there is a perforation going through, then you get your um, SD depression, really, for the, on, on the injury current. So look out for that. Um, but also remember that uh, the person, the implanter, could also reverse the pose as well. Yeah. Um, that can also cause that as well. So watch out for that, especially for registrars who are, not, who, who are inexperienced. Can can also do that as well. So also make sure that you put it, you put the pose on right when they're connecting it to the lead um, tips, um, the terminal pins. So. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Fellows, fellows will do that, especially like people who are still training. We'll just you know. Um, so in general, uh, for everyone, if you're doing you know hooking up a lead, it's it's black to the pin and then red to the ring. But you know, we'll tell you in the case when we see a negative. Injury current. 
Perfect. Julius, Jared, do you have, do you have other stuff? I, I think that we could probably, you know, I benefit from your insight with any of this. So. Um, now that was the main point on those ones. The other, the other thing I, and you can confirm as you're the expert with Abbott, but the one thing I do like about your devices is with your cap confirm is instead of having the auto threshold at double the output, yours works almost on a beat to beat. Um, is that correct? Yeah, correct. So, so you uh, place like point point two five above threshold, but if you don't get it, if you if there's no evoke potential after the spike, then you hit with a five volt output as a backup pulse. Correct. Uh, yeah. So that, that's how our unit or that's how our system works for auto capture. Um, if you're talking about by V's, if you look at like LV cap confirm or RV cap confirm, uh, those are not beat by beat. Those run on a cycle. Um, and that's why you see a higher margin. But with auto capture, it's just 0.25 volts over the um, over the threshold. And uh, that's just to ensure it. And then it has a backup pace. One thing to remember, though, however, is uh, the backup pulse is unipolar. So um, if you have like an electrically isolated can, which you may not see a lot of, but sometimes the patient have allergies, uh, they'll electrically, they'll insulate the can. Um, or if you have issues with unipolar pacing, um, you know, that that backup pulse could cause trouble. For example, unipolar pacing can cause uh, pocket stimulation or stimulate the can. Uh, so the patient actually feels that um, in their chest. So. Um, <clears throat> so I was going to say um, for Medtronic, um, obviously Medtronic has got like an adaptive, um, adaptive, you know, the auto capture management and auto sensors that is called adaptive management. Um, the other thing to bear in mind, if, if say, for instance, you're having like a higher threshold um, um, or since, since after implant and you want to put adaptive on because um, you don't know it might keep creeping up and things. Um, I know that we've sent with Boston, if you do put that, um, um, that capture management on, um, it does have a limit of like V output. So it won't go any higher than five volts. Mm -hmm. um, so you could run into trouble with that. I think Medtronic is a little bit higher than that. Um, whereas if you were putting it on manually, you can certainly put it to about 7.5, you know, output mm -hmm. and that. So, um, with, with Boston, there are limitations of that. I think many Medtronic is a little bit higher than that. Than that. So um, we have been caught out before in the past when somebody's having like the threshold is creeping up and you prove, which is it's sensible to put a, you know, adaptive or capture management on because it mm -hmm. could, you know, it does auto, auto threshold checks and then it's just accordingly. Um, but there are limits to, for instance, if the lead, ends up like if the threshold ends up being really high about five or six, then you can run into trouble. Um, you know, if the patient has got complete heart block or something. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Uh, Abbott goes to five as well, just so you know, five volts. So uh, yeah, I think they're great because as you said, it, it can give you a trend over time, but um, if their threshold is getting up there and if it's already at four, then you may want to turn auto capture off and give yourself a nice two to one and obviously schedule them for some sort of lead revision eventually because that's going to wear the battery out quickly. Uh, one thing too to me that I want to mention with Abbott's auto capture and I'm sure with the other devices is their they can be tricked with um, fusion. So we talked in previous weeks about fusion. Um, and pseudo fusion when you're pacing into an intrinsic event and you either contribute to the pacing or it doesn't really do anything. Um, the device using its auto capture algorithms is looking at what the evoked response is from the pacing spike to the actual, you know, evoked response of the tissue. And if you're fusing, that can change the morphology of the wave. So patients with AFib with RVR or a lot of PVCs it can no longer determine, well, this is what capture looks like. It may think it's not capturing and it will go to a high output, which means that it'll just go ahead and start pacing its backup pulse here at five volts um, unipolar. So a patient that could have a threshold of 0.5 volts at 0.5 milliseconds may be pacing all the time at five volts, prematurely wearing down the battery because we're trying to make auto capture work when it doesn't work for this patient. Um, in those cases, just set a nice fixed output. So, yeah, AJ. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
So uh, let's go to the passive lead and active lead. <clears throat> okay. Good. So <clears throat> uh, for, because here we plant more of uh, active lead here. Uh, I think about 98% of our implants here are active leads. Hmm. So one of the things that we also observe in our implant here is once the, for the active leads, once you rotate the, the tip of that body of the leads and the screw comes out at the end into the myocardium, Mm -hmm. That screw does not move further again. So the risk of uh, perforating the myocardium in the new technology is very, very low. But if you rotate it several times, because once the leads, once it comes out, I can show you, I have a lead here. Yeah, once it comes out, you can see it here. Uh, I don't know whether you can see my hand. Okay, good, good, good. Let's see. Yeah, you can see my hand. Am I right? Good. Yep. So once this lead come, once it comes out, it doesn't move. It doesn't move further from that point. So rotating it several times means that that screw is going to be turning within that segment where it pierces the myocardium. And it has... Oh, looks like we may have lost you for a second here. So I'm gonna give him a little bit more time. I'm not sure if everyone else can hear me. Um, is anyone else in the line still, or do we lose everybody? I'm here, Mike. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. We'll wait for him to come back. But for those in the line, uh, what he's talking about is essentially the the screw here uh, is comes out. So you make contact with the tissue itself, and then um, you will then exercise, or you'll then extend the helix into the tissue. Um, for St. Jude devices, we generally look for a nice W shake on fluoroscopy to indicate that you put the screw out enough. If you screw it out too far though, you can you run the risk of having micro perfs, um, which are obviously not ideal for the patient. I don't know, uh, Jared, um, Julius, what, what are your, what are your general, uh, what do you look for for a Medtronic lead when you're putting it out? Yeah, with, especially with Medtronic, they have a, um, they have little markers that are seen under fluoroscopy. So what we usually typically do is just zoom in with X-ray, and you can see mm -hmm. the the you can see the radio peg markers close up. So you know then your helix is fully extracted. Um, so you know at that point is when you stop rotating the helix. Mm -hmm. um, I know with Boston leads they have a little different because obviously a lot of the other leads uh, is you deploy the helix, but in some of the Boston leads I know you actually have to rotate the actual whole lead to the helix is actually out already. And oh, it's got, yeah. It's got a covered tip on it. So when it hits the myocardium, the blood, it dissolves or something, and then you actually physically rotate the whole lead to um, to migrate it. So just a little thing, little something a little different, but something to look out for as well. Yeah. Uh, so what he was referring to, uh, sorry, Julius, I don't know if you're jumping in, but what uh, like a Boston sweet tip lead, it has like a sugar uh, or polysaccharide in the front uh, on the tip that kind of isolates the... Um, the uh, helix as you're moving through the vasculature because you don't want to have this traumatic sharp helix out. It'll just get caught on everything. So you get it inside the ventricle and then it dissolves um, after a minute or two and then you're able to actually screw it into the tissue uh, without it getting stuck up here when you're in the um, you know SVC region. Uh, okay. So AJ, have you answered it? Yeah, have you explained it? Uh, I'm not sure exactly where you're going with that. So I was going to wait till you came back. Oh, so <clears throat> what I was saying is mm -hmm. that this active lead you see here. Yeah, this is the active lead. Uh, let me see if I can find you. There you are. Yeah, this, yeah, this is the active lead. Once this lead is rotated and it comes out, it doesn't move further. 
any longer. So the risk of piercing through the myocardium is reduced in the latest technology. I don't know that or I don't know whether the same thing with uh, St. Jude and Boston, but this is what is specific to uh, what you, we see in the Metronic uh, uh, leads. Once it comes out, it doesn't move further. But I think it's the same with all the company leads for the active leads. So the issue is that once it comes out, there is no need of uh, further turning because it will rotate in this at the same point mm. the second thing is you talk about you talk about the current of uh, injury mm. are you looking for the positive deflection or you are looking for negative deflection or for both so negative is an indicator that you could possibly have perfed uh, so in general, you don't want to see negative. There are specific yeah. instances where the lead could be laying against the septum. And if you think about yeah. the depolarization of the heart, I'm going to move you here. If you think about the depolarization of the heart, uh, you have, it, it moves from the septum to the rest of, uh, to the apex and then to the free wall here. So if your lead is kind of sitting on the septum like that, then you could possibly see a negative deflection. It is possible. It's less likely. It's more likely to see in like, um, uh, what do they call device? Uh, uh, leadless devices. But if you're laying against the septum, it's possible. But in general, if you see a negative injury current, that's a strong indicator that you need to take a closer look at this lead. Obviously, these leads are not very big. Um, so the risk with PERF is a lot less than, say, a leadless. But in general, you still need to... Um, to attend to it and then possibly even do a, do an echo to make sure. But uh, yeah, you wanna see you wanna see QRS widening and then also ST elevation with your injury current. All right, good. Yeah. Now, my <laughs> next uh, comment. Sorry, Sorry, Dr. Daffy. Um, I was gonna, your, yes. first, your first question, like um, for implantists um, with Medtronic Hope, I think with any of the manufacturers, when you're turning the screw on, when you're deploying the helix, um, because there's a latency in the talk, um, you have to make sure that you take your time, especially with Medtronic of Boston, like, you know, one, rotate, two, and you wait for, for the force, the talk to spread through, because sometimes you, you, it's possible to overdo it, um, and that, and you you might end up jamming like the screw mechanism and things. So there there is a latency in the top. So you, you just give it time one, and you wait two very very slowly, and that that seems to help. Hello. You are right. Yeah, yeah. All right. And depending on the, how the next question, yeah, the next question is on the issue of the. Uh, of the blanking, sometimes we uh, we put it in partial, partial plus. AJ, what is the difference between these two? Uh, I'm sorry, you said the difference with blanking is you you put it in what? Sorry, partial and partial plus. That, yeah, partial. That's Medtronic. That's Medtronic. Yes. Yeah. Um, right. I'll go ahead and let you explain. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so, um, okay, that's, that's Medtronic's uh, PVAP. So um, Medtronic um, normally have like an absolute blanking period of about, I think, 30 milliseconds. And then partial will add an additional 150 milliseconds on top um, where, where basically it will, it, will, it will blank anything. But so um, based on the sensitivity, based on the sensitivity that you've set it up, so, for instance, if you see in a far field R wave on the atrial channel, um, and um, and if it's in partial, um, and you're still seeing it, but the difference between partial and partial plus is that partial mm -hmm. plus also adds an additional 150 milliseconds blanking period, but the partial plus um, will adjust automatically adjust the sensitivity and in, um, decrease it, decrease it. So you're less likely to see any far field um, R wave over sensing on the uh, main channel. But at the same time, both of them will add any atrial tachyarrhythmia that comes up and add it to the um, to the bin, like the counter, if you like. So so that if there is any um, AF or atrial tachy, 
in the H2 channel, it will basically, if it needs to inappropriate your mode switch, sorry, appropriate your mode switch, it will do that. So the difference between partial and partial plus is partial plus um, will have the same blanking period interval, but it will basically add, add um, it, it, it will auto, um, it, it will auto decrease um, the sensitivity. And that's so you can't, you don't see um, like far field hours and things like that. So that's a metronic. Okay. If, okay. So if you so put, what algorithm oh, is St. Jude's? Uh, okay. What algorithm is St. Jude's uh, cover for the Pasha plus and Pasha? AJ. So uh, St. Jude, basically, you have your standard PVARP, and then you'll have yep. uh, like PMT prevention algorithms. So if you're talking about like preventing PMT, it'll have like an A pace on PVC where when a PVC occurs, the device will um, basically withhold, it'll avoid atrially tracking and then it will atrially pace to regain control of the atrium and then it will restart the cycle. So basically what it's doing is it's saying like ignore after a PVC, ignore what could be happening in the atrium, wait 330 milliseconds, and then atrially pace to regain control of the atrium and restart the cycle to try to keep a PMT from ever occurring. And then with PMT, there's different algorithms to um, basically determine by doing wiggle tests. It, I could really get into the weeds here with this, but in general, um, just different ways that the companies have found to, uh, to avoid causing PMT. When you talk about Good. absolute blanking, there are... Um, I think we kind of talked about this. I don't know, maybe Elvis, maybe this was you and I when we were talking about it the other day studying for the IBHRE, but the devices have um, basically looking for crosstalk detection windows and things like that as well to avoid any kind of crosstalk and inhibition. Um, and that's more of the PVAB side of things, which would be absolute blanking. Thank you, sir. Well, Okay. Yeah, I think one of the key take-home messages, especially when it comes to programming, is that, yeah, as AJ said before, is making sure that you're not, if you are seeing some far-field R waves or something like that on the mm -hmm. actual channel, is your first your first thing should not be increasing PVABs and uh, PVARPs immediately. Try, my, I personally always try to change sensitivity where I possibly can. Because as we, a bit like with an ICD, if you start putting your PVABs out and your PVAPs way out, then as you go into maybe sinus, you know, high rate exercise, then you may end up having, end up blanking actually appropriate sinus beats. So it's, um, it's important to use sensitivity first when trying to get rid of far field R waves and not necessarily blanking. Yeah, that's, Look, a, good that's, that's a good point. But um, um, so Medtronic, obviously, um, Jared, you know, they've got partial and partial plus as a already pre preset values. Yes. And, and they um, obviously both of them work um, that you won't, um, if there are any atrial tachyarrhythmias, they will actually um, detect them and add them to the counter so that um, it will not inhibit any um, and bring on any inappropriate mode switch. And it will, it will, it will appropriately mode switch if it needs to. Um, the, only, the only thing I will say about partial plus and, and uh, I think nominally, um, Medtronic have partial on, but if you don't see any far field light, and um, what Jara is saying, always look to see if you can actually change the sensitivity first. And if not, then obviously you can program on partial plus, but it will, like the algorithm does consume more battery though. So obviously bear that in mind as well um, and that so yeah okay so aj let me give uh, let me give an example of something that happened uh, that was um a week ago uh we did a dual chamber pacemaker and um uh this patient as at the time of implant the uh, the thresholds were all fine. Ventricular threshold, we got 0 0.7. Atrial threshold was around 0 0.6. But uh, I did that programming with uh, uh, Mr. Julius. But on the a few days after the implant, uh, the, I felt that the man was excessively moving that hand. You will strut him, put him on... Um, 
on uh, arm strength, but on his own, he does what he wants to do. So when we came back to look at the programming, we noticed that there, uh, there was a warning of high ventricular threshold. Hmm. So I did a programming with uh, Julius and um, we tried to see what happened, but I knew that we are already uh, likely going to go back to reposition that leads. So we, uh, Julius is here. He, he, he showed me so many things to do and we did it uh, because when you show that high ventricular threshold, a device that's supposed to have 10.5 years, you will, not, you will not see around five years. Mm. And I don't really like those things. African patients are people that you must satisfy when they come to you the first time. And uh, so I knew that this team may likely land us again into repositioning. So I gave this man uh, three days to return back. He returned back on the third days. I looked at it again. You see that the amplitude uh, that was set at uh, 3.5 has gone back to five. And the warning appeared again. So at that point, I did not call Julius. I just told the man, we are going to reposition your ventricular lead. So we went back, opened up again, and repositioned the ventricular lead. It took us about 20 minutes because we opened up, uh, took, um, uh, took a stylet into the ventricular lead, unscrew it, then reposition it, and uh, close back again. So now after that, everything went on fine. So what could you have done, AJ? And uh, Gilos is here. Uh, after the repositioning, I call him and uh, we, we, we interrogate the device and everything is fine. Okay, so what would you have done before revising, do you mean? Or what would you have done? I think, I think you and Julius made the right call that uh, revising, but I think there's a number of things you would address first is, are you able to get a chest x-ray and see if the lead is visibly moved? Uh, because Correct. Can... Okay. Correct. That is a good question, man, sir. What we did, I took him into the uh, cat lab, the first thing before, because we have the image, the final image as at the time of, uh, after the, uh, the first device closure, we have the final image. So we looked at it, still in the cat lab, we looked at it. Then we took another image before the opener and noticed that that device has shifted. Mm. And not that ventricular is has shifted. Yes. So we did that. Okay. I mean, if, if your threshold's not great and you, the lead is clearly moved acutely, I would say, you know, a revision is probably in order. I'm sure. I mean, Jared, I, I think your input would be great here too, since you have experience. But I mean, if you're not, if you're not capturing well, it's obviously in a different location, then you may need to just go in and revise it while you still can, um, as opposed to waiting for tissue and growth and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree, AJ. Um, I think you're right, Dr. Julius and uh, Mr. Gerard. Hello, sir. Um, yes, sir. I think you're right. I think, I don't think this was a, an operator thing. It, it sounded like, as you said, the patient probably moving his arm too much caused a micro displacement yes. of the lead. And the helix yes. has just come back just that that little bit enough to do increase the threshold. And there's nothing else you can do other than go back in, unfortunately. All right. Just for our own um, knowledge, do you typically, where do you typically place your ventricular lead? Do you go for like more of an apical placement or do you go like mid, mid to high septum or? No, it's more of apical. If I okay. don't get good sensing, a uh, good sensing and threshold at the apica, then I go for septum. But the first thing is apica. Then also on the echo, before I do all my cases, I usually do echo for them. Look mm. at the apex, see how thick the apex is. All this also helped me to go for the apica at once. But once I go for the apica, I don't. If I don't have good sensing and good threshold. Then I move. Then I start looking out for uh, uh, for the septum. Okay. And if I get that at the septum, I move on and screw it and move on. 
Jared and Jared Julius, do you typically see that as well as is apical placement? I, I know that for pacemakers, we've moved uh, a lot of people will go more mid septal, and then for like defibrillators, they'll tend to go more apical, so you have good um, yeah. inferior coil placement. Yeah. Yeah. I, <clears throat> yeah. We 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 have we have a consultant who um, AJ. I'm hoping that he will come on. For the leadless um, pacemaker talk, and um, the one I was speech, speaking to you about, and I think Dr. Daffy knows him, Dr. Sharman, and he he doesn't like our waves that are less than ten millivolts, um, so he, he tends to like to reposition, reposition, um, and things. But I think typically, just like you said, mid septum, um, low septum, um, and then um, he would do. Um, obviously, it depends on if it's a young patient. He does really, really try. Um, somebody who is not going to be pacing a lot, he does actually really, really try to um, go for um, septum as much mm -hmm. as he can. Um, somebody who's going to be pacing a lot, obviously you have, have voice um, going, RV apex um, and that. But um, yeah, um, you know, so he horses for courses as it were. Um, but yeah, we, we do we do, do a lot of um, septal implants. Yeah, he does a lot of septal implants. Um, but with, with ICDs, yeah. Um, most of the ICD patients are not um, sort of patient indicated. So, um, yeah, we tend to go for um, RV, um, APEX, uh, and things like that. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a difference, isn't it, between um, like DFT, correct me if I'm wrong, like Jared and AJ, with DFTs, if RV APEX is preferred um, to um, RV septum, like if it's mid or, or high septum, um, position in terms of like you know DFT shock shock pathway defibrillator and that what do you think with ICDs? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure about what it does to DFT whether you're in the apex or the septum. I mean, obviously, if you're septum, it maybe changes the position of the uh, RV coil. But as the threat as the shock vectors are coming from the coils, I, I, I'm not aware of apical versus uh, septum what it does to a DFT threshold, unfortunately, but Okay. Just to touch on the points of uh, putting the lead in the RV apex or the septum, I mean, as you say, it, there's pros and cons for both. Um, I think if you can go septum, obviously you're going to, the idea, especially in you know, a sum with heart block, you're going to get ideally get a nice and narrow QRS complex as it follows the conduction system a little bit better. Um, obviously the apex, you know, ideal world, it's going to be a lot thicker. So less perforation risk. Uh, you've got uh, a lot more stability in the apex, perhaps, than you are on the septum as gravity pulls the lead down a little bit more on the septum. So pros and cons to both, I think. Yeah, I think, so you both made very good points. Uh, yeah, I really can't speak to any knowledge as far as DFTs, but yeah, I agree. You tend to have more, um, you know, apical, you tend to have more stability versus up here, you're kind of hanging um, on the mid septum. But um, I, so we, we're going to be talking about this probably a little more when we talk about leadless pacemaker implants, but there's in researching leadless, I think that you can actually learn quite a bit about RV anatomy and uh, lead placement. So there's been some studies basically that show um, good safe placement, especially of leadless, but any kind of device. So if you're looking at like an RAO here, um, I don't know why I bother writing these out, but in general, um, when you're placing a lead or a leadless device up here, your anterior groove of your heart, your inferior groove of your heart and your apex are all pretty dangerous spots because you're getting away from the thicker tissue of the septum and you're getting to more either the lateral tissue or like this transitionary tissue where the RV connects to the septum. So when you're looking in RAO, your lead placement, ideal spots if you're going more apical, especially for like leadless, for example, is right around here. You're safe all the way around all across here, but then you worry about valve interaction, right? Because you're valve. Um, when you're looking at LAO, this is a terrible LAO view, but SVC, IVC, um, LV, your uh, left ventricle is going to be a uh, more dominant structure versus your RV is going to be more of a crescent shape. Um, you want to see a foreshortened view of your lead. And then ideally, if you're coming from a, from a superior axis, 
you kind of want to use these radians as an indicator of lead placement here, right? So if you look and your lead is pointing straight that way, it's probably placing itself straight into the septum, right? Because this is your septal wall between the right, uh, right ventricle and left ventricle. If you're looking at it and the lead is kind of facing down at an angle here, so you're going down like this, it's probably still septally oriented. And as long as you're not placing the lead out here, you're probably not in the apex. So this is all like your apical area. So you're looking at your REO space to determine um, your your ventricular your ventricular space, and you're kind of aiming for a sweet spot around here. Uh, you're looking at LV and these radians to determine the actual lead placement. Um, and then if you're looking at it in LAO and <laughs> it's facing like this, that means that your lead could very well be um, any kind of free wall orientation. So I know this is kind of like off topic of the subject, but you kind of got me interested when you're talking about like lead placement and orientation. So just things to look at. I always recommend working, um, looking at the lead in RAO, just to determine that you're not in these danger zones and you're well within um, nice right ventricular space. And then looking at an LAO to determine whether or not you're septally oriented. Uh, most of these leads have about a two millimeter helix and they're pretty small French size. So if you were anterior, it may not be the end of the world if you were on the free wall or the thinner tissue of the heart. Um, but there's still a higher perf risk, uh, still higher micro perf risk. So um, always take that account. And if you can, you know, septally place it. Even if you're apical, you still want to make sure that you're against like the nice thick tissue as opposed to this thinner tissue out here. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Jared, Julius, do you have anything else you want to add? No, that was perfect. I thought that was, that was really good. Yeah, that was nice, mate. Look forward to look forward to the leadless talk, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be honest. So I, I've been studying leadless for about a year and a half now as we go through our launch. And it has made me a lot better at understanding like the right ventricular space and made me a better implanter in general, I would say not implanter, but you know, rep. Uh, so I, I, I'm excited to, for you all to see it. And there's some really cool studies um, like this rating one. I'll see if I can actually find the study itself, but it basically just talks about lead placement based upon um, the degree. Obviously, if you're going from an inferior approach, you're looking at the opposite, but well, well, I appreciate you everyone um, jumping on this call. Sorry, I kind of bumbled my way through the first half of the call, but I'm glad we got there in the end. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, reach out to me, reach out to any of our other friends here. We're all here to help uh, support and, you know, build these programs. So let us know how we can help. Excellent. Well, thanks, Gerard. Um, thanks, AJ, rather. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Gerard, as well. <laughs> thanks, Gerard. Thanks, AJ. Thanks, Gerard. Thanks, AJ. Thanks, Gerard. Thank yeah, thanks.